Speech of Five Presents, The Audiobook of Hale, The Rise of the Griffins by J.K. Noble. Chapter 2. Ron obsessively works over a large wooden desk. He writes as fast as his mind works, all the while mumbling bits of incantations he ought to use. The room is lit by candlelight, some on nearby candelabras, others scattered across the room. The cabin is lined with oak from ceiling to floor. Beside the living room is a bedroom in the corner, the shadow of a small cot visible from Grion's seat. Grion's hands grasp the roots of his hair as he looks over his notes. No, no, it can't be this. I'd have to remove the nymph stew for it to. He crosses his writings. Down below in the cellar, Hale wakes. Carly is lying over him to warm his cold, wet body, and he squeezes her tightly. She smiles. Guess what? Before Hale can respond, she whips out a set of keys. Her wrists are unshackled. Hale gasps. They fell from his pocket, she explains. We're getting out of here, tonight. After she unshackles her brother, they creep up the stairs and crouch beside the door. Hale holds his hand out for the keys, but Carly places a finger to her lips. Voices sound in the room beyond. Right above Gron's desk comes a voice, startling him half to death. What progress have you made? He jumps, and his pen flies behind him. The voice chuckles. Honestly, Gron, you should be used to my visits by now. Gron sits back in his chair, and looks up at the levitating window above the desk, its oval rim clouded with smoke. In it is Bayo. Hale presses his ear against the door and whispers that other person's voice. Goosebumps rise on Carly's forearms before he'd even finished his sentence. It's so familiar, isn't it? Hale continues. No, Carly says at once. I've never heard it before. The sound of the voice replays in Hale's mind, calling him to find a memory. Lost in the void, Carly eases Hale away. Let's wait until he falls asleep. Igron rests his arm on his chair, and covers his mouth. She is reluctant. Bayo, he says. Bayo's cheerful expression turns ferocious. His eyes narrow dangerously. But I've made progress on my own, Gron adds hastily. I shall try this cure tonight. You mean the paper, whose contents you just crossed out? Bayo asks sarcastically. Gron looks up into the window. Yes, I believe I'm getting closer to the answer, he assures Bayo. Fierce pain courses through his body, and he gasps, grasping the back of his chair. Grion's knees buckle, and slowly, he sinks to the floor, holding in his screams. Bayo fumes, oh, but you see, that is what you've said to me for the last three months since you've captured them, and what you said to me since before then as well. Gritting his teeth, Grion manages, yes, but remember, it is I who found them, not only once, but twice since the incident, and I've captured them on my own. I have done well by you, Bayo. I suspect in no time at all I will have ready what you require. You are too soft on her. I should have sent Ryoma to do the job. Soft, I have done everything you asked me and more to try to persuade her, going against my every instinct to do your bidding. What is your instinct? Bayo asks with a biting tone, setting them both free to make a muck of my plans. She is Felix's daughter, Grion counters. This isn't easy for me. Nonetheless, she won't be able to go on for much longer. Suddenly, a sense of relief washes over Grion's body. He rises to his feet. May your words hold value, Grion. Bayo responds coolly. I have been gracious to you with my time. Think of your merry and inner. Grion replies in a whisper. Yes, they are the reason I do your bidding. Bayo laughs. <laughs> there will never be an escape from me, old friend. I will always find a way to get what I desire. Grion purses his lips. And once you achieve even that, you will desire more. I always did appreciate your honesty, Bayo says with a smirk. Carly refuses to tell him the truth. Why don't I do it? No, Grion, it's not your place. Leave such matters to me. Then the portal vanishes. Hale and Carly keep watch for nearly an hour, waiting until the candlelight fades from the crack beneath the door. Then, a set of footsteps shuffling above their heads makes its way to the end of the house. 
The pop sounds on a spring mattress. Then all is silent. A little longer, Carly says in a rough whisper, Don't fall asleep. Hale nods, his heart beating feverishly. He notices Carly's bruised neck and shaking hands, marks of her bravery. A half hour passes and Carly signals Hale to make their way up the steps. He creeps behind her. At the top, she turns the key in the door as carefully as possible. He opens. Hale is suddenly lightheaded as Carly scans the room. Finally, she signals him to follow her. The cabin is old-fashioned. There is no electricity. The only light comes from the moon peering through the window and shining on a desk stacked with leather-bound books and loose papers. On the way to the door, Hale glances over the papers written in purple ink. They are written in a strange language, and yet, miraculously, he is able to read it. He mumbles the words written at the top, antidote for blood protection against magic. Carly grabs his hands and pulls him along. Atop a counter is a dagger, and Hale snatches it impulsively before they leave. They run. They're hardly free. Carly darts for the woods several yards away, with Hale right behind her. The light gust of wind washes through the clearing, and a sharp squeak sounds from behind them. The front door. They hadn't closed it when they left. Carly rushes back to the cabin, attempting to prevent it from shutting with a bang. But it's too late. Carly <gasps> locks eyes with her panicked brother. Run. She mouths, dashing to the trees. She sprints with a limp, touching her bruised rib cage. They just make it to the trees when the door reopens and Leon stumbles out from the cabin clutching a dagger. He spots them in the distance and bolts after them. Panting heavily, Carly commands, hide behind the trees. Carly and Hale sink into the darkness of the woods as cautiously as possible. Hale peers over to his sister several trees away and swallows. She brings a finger to her lips. He nods. There is a rustling. Leon enters the thicket. Come back and no harm will come to either of you, he shouts. Then internally, Carly, don't do this. She responds in his mind, please let us go. But he could not let them go. An image of Mary and Ina floats through his mind, and Carly understands. Hale's blood pounds in his ears, and he takes in deep breaths to keep calm. He hears Brion breaking twigs nearby, getting closer and closer to his hiding place. Hale focuses on his breathing, in and out, in and out. His palms feel sweaty on his dagger, and he tries not to think of all that is at stake. Suddenly, a cool blade is pressed against Hale's throat, and a strong hand grabs his upper arm. Hale spins around and kicks Brion in the stomach. Brion releases him, clutching his beaten torso. Hale's kick carries him off balance, and he falls. As Brion advances once more, he can see the fear in Hale's eyes and the dagger shaking in Hale's hands. Brion slows his approach. Come now, we both know you won't hurt me, he says. Hale spots his sister's silhouette behind Brion and throws his dagger to her without a thought. She catches it. As Brion turns, Carly attacks. She slashes her knife downward, but he backs away just in time. Their knives clash. Hale rises to his feet, bewildered by his sister. He watches in shock as Carly and Grion dance around the woods, skillfully dodging one another's blows. Carly moves to stab Grion, but he catches her arm and twists it, forcing her back to him. As she struggles to break free, she falls into his dagger that he had pointed toward her with his free hand. The knife enters the left side of her lower back, and she falls to her knees, crying out in pain. Grion's hand still clasps the dagger. Carly's back is stained red with blood. Hale rushes to his sister and screams her name in horror. Before he makes it to Carly's side, Gron grabs the hysterical boy. He wraps his arms around Hale's torso, pulling him back toward the cabin. Hale's body shakes with adrenaline. His eyes blur at the sight of Carly's lips slick with blood. A wave of fierce anger pulses through him, and Hale's vision turns black. Suddenly, Grion wails in great agony and drops Hale. Carly. Hale jolts to his feet and runs back to her. He finds her resting against the base of a tree trunk. She holds her back, trying to contain the flow of blood, tearing through the pain. Hale, she manages. I don't have a lot of time. Don't be afraid. 
dropped his eyes well up as he moves her to look at the injury. It's not that bad. We can go get help. Listen to me, Carly says urgently. Your amulet, do you still have it? He nods, his tears flowing freely. Good, she coughs. Never take it off. It is the only thing protecting you now. Do you understand? He nods again. She smiles and holds his hand with both of hers, and Hale is disturbed by the lack of strength in her grip. Promise me you will live a good life. Her wet blood smears his palms. His body heaves, the forest echoing with his sobs. Promise me, she says again weakly. Unable to breathe, she wheezes. I pro, I, why? I promise, he stammers. Her hand slips from his, and her body slides down the trunk. Her head falls to the side. No, Carly, don't leave me. His sobs grow heavier with each breath. He buries his head into her chest, rocking back and forth in an endless motion. Please. 